marriages rarely have the intensity that these longer term adolescent relationships do. When I hear that kids have been together five months, six months, seven months, or certainly these kids like two years, Rena, that's like a 10 year marriage. I mean, these are very, very deep relationships. And so when these relationships end, the chasm that is left is huge. Episode 165, How Do I Support My Heartbroken Son? Well, it's April. For parents who don't have high school seniors, what is going on in the world of high school seniors right now with college? College stuff is getting nailed down, Rena. Kids are making choices. The future is coming into focus for kids who are planning to go to college. And it's a rich and spicy time Mm. in family life and also with kids. You know what's interesting, Lisa? Since we've started this podcast, which was in 2020, every year I feel like the college process is different because COVID factored into it, then getting out of COVID, and there's always something. So I am thinking of these parents who have high school seniors and cannot imagine ever being at that point, which you were just a couple years oh, ago. I was, and I will get you through it, Raina. I know you will. You always <laughs> you always get us through the teen years. You're the one. Um, I want to read this letter because this also has to deal with um, transition and, and senior year. Dear Dr. Lisa and Raina, My 17-year-old high school son, a high school senior, just had a really hard breakup with his girlfriend. They've been together since they were sophomores, and she told him that she doesn't want to try to keep dating when they're in college. So she feels it's best to break up now. He's absolutely heartbroken. He mopes around the house. I can hear him crying in his room. And sometimes he just loses himself in video games. Seeing him in so much pain is breaking my heart. But when I try to get him to talk to me about it, he just shuts me out. I think he still talks to his ex-girlfriend sometimes, and they have many of the same friends. I know he misses her terribly, but I don't think being in contact with her is helping. What, if anything, can I do for him? Oh, Lisa, first love. Oh, you feel it. Don't you feel it? Yes, this sweet boy. I it, I really feel it, and I've really seen it, Rena. and it is a lot of pain. So it is a lot of pain. Walk us through this, like this first heartbreak, when you have a high schooler or a college student who's going through heartbreak, what do parents need to keep in mind? It really hurts. It really, really mm-hmm. hurts. And I think, Rena, this is where I love having practice for so long, because I've watched kids in these intense relationships. So these kids have been together since sophomore year. Marriages rarely have the intensity that these longer-term adolescent relationships do. Why is that? Well, there's lots of reasons. First of all, I think because it's got all the like juice and charge of adolescent emotionality. Second of all, like if you think in like sort of time scale, you know, I always use the seven times multiplier for teenagers, like a year and like that's like dog years for teenagers, <laughs> like a year of adult life is like seven years for a teenager. It's oh, good. So when I hear that kids have been together five months, six months, seven months, eight, you know, like, or certainly these kids, like two years, Rena, that's like a 10 year marriage. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are very, very deep relationships. And then the other thing, and this is so different from when we were teenagers, they are in constant contact. That's so true. They wake up, they text each other, good morning. They go to bed with their phones next to each other, sleeping, you know, talking to each other as they fall asleep. They are They also, I mean, they'll see each other in school all day if they go to school, but it's also really, really common that when they're not together, they have their phones on FaceTime Mm. and just open. So they'll be like puttering around their own rooms or doing their homework. They are in like almost 24-7 contact with one another when they're in these relationships in a way that was not technologically possible for us as adolescents. And so when these relationships end, the chasm that is left is huge. And isn't so, it hard because his mom's saying they have so many mutual friends together, which is usually the case. It is usually the case, right? So this poor boy is this giant walking open wound, right? He didn't want this. And he's seeing her all the time. They're together all the time. And then, Rena, I will even tell you, again, we had it so good. We had no idea how we had it so good. <laughs> even if she goes to another school, right? They're looking at each other's activity online. Oh, they can see each other unless they unfollow, yes. right? Unless they unfollow, which then, of course, like looks really rude or harsh. I mean, it has all these other implications. So I end up taking care of kids who have like broken up. They want to be done with it, but they're watching their ex like hang out with other people, date other people. It's like, Rena, 
it's so painful. Like it is just, there's like, there's wounds upon wounds for these poor kiddos. And then there's just buckets and buckets of salt getting poured in them sometimes, often as a result of what is technologically available to them. Yeah. So I want you to weigh in on the love component here. Do you Mm -hmm. think, based on your experience and what you've seen over two Mm -hmm. decades, should kids break up before college? Okay. Here's what I have learned in my time, Rena. (laughs) There are three crappy options. (laughs) There's no good option. (laughs) There's three crappy options for these high school romances to um, choose among. Okay, so one is doing what this couple is trying to do. Well, he's not wanting it, but of saying like, you know what? We're not going to try to stay together through college. Mm -hmm. Let's end now so we can kind of heal, move on, focus on our friends, whatever, you know, the rationale is. Okay, clearly... I'm sure it's it's definitely crappy for him. It doesn't seem like it's I doubt it's like perfect for the girl either. Because again, these are really intense relationships that would not otherwise end. So that's crappy option number one. Crappy option number two is let's try to stay together. This sometimes works. People end up getting married. True. But it has the, you know, asterisk on it of like, it's kind of hard to go to college and be 100% invested in college if 90% of your heart is deeply in love with somebody at another college some other place That's or back true. home. So right? you're saying it can really be distracting, the distance. Yeah, it's not ideal, right? It's yeah. not ideal. The third crappy option, which I see a lot of kids attempt and is really hard, is let's end the romance, right? We're not going to continue our romance in college, but we're incredibly close we take up a huge part of each other's lives. We count on each other tremendously. So let's just be friends, mm. right? And they try to like downshift, like I'm thinking about a car, like from like the gear of romance into the gear of friendship, yeah. which doesn't, isn't very easy to do, right? Uh-huh. I mean, I, I think you Once can you've be gone, friends. That way it's just hard yes. to hit reverse and go back is what you're saying. Exactly. Like, it, And maybe you've had this in your life over time. Like there are guys who I dated, who I am now friends with, but you need an interval, Mm-hmm. I find. Yes. Right? Yes. Where you're not when you're saying when you're coming so out of an intense relationship, you yeah. can't just throw yourself into another intense relationship like you need or into to a friendship or a and friendship. just have it like operate smoothly, right? right? Yep. Maybe if you like don't see the guy for a couple of years and then you guys decide to be friends or, you know, but this is a lot to think about when you're in your teens, Lisa. This is a lot to oh, think about. I know. And part of me I wants know. to say, guys, just enjoy it until August and then hit the brakes and see where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Um but you're saying these are all crappy options. Yeah, they have no good choices. Yeah. And and I've actually found over years of practicing that it's reassuring, weirdly, to just say that to kids. Like, here are your options, none ideal. What's the um least the most appealing of the bad options, right? Like and what what do you and can you you and the kid you're dating like come to agreement on or try to find some resolution around. But Rena, I promise you, these are um, top to bottom messy. There is no clean and easy way out of these relationships. But I like what you're saying because when kids go through heartbreak, I feel as parents, we're just watching them do it and you just feel so helpless and your heart is just in a blender is what it feels like. Mm. But you're saying, and this is what I love about what you say to us often is like talking to them, even these are three crappy options, being upfront about it, saying this is what, because sometimes when you're so in love, you're not thinking rationally. I think that's true, right? And so the gift adults can give teenagers is perspective, right? The nature of being a teenager, especially in a very emotionally intense moment, is that you lose perspective. That's the neurological reality, right? So the rule of adults is to be like, okay, I have seen this before. Let me tell you as big as and bad as this feels, you know, this is part of a array of things that does happen to humans. And here's the way that this can unfold. And of course you feel lousy. And there's no version of this where you're going to feel great. Like that kind of loving 30,000 foot-ish look at it is important. Side by side with that, taking so seriously how painful it is to them, right? I think that it's very easy in these moments to be like, it's just high school, like kind of what you said, like, it's just high school, like you should be having a great time. Mm -hmm. And it was very helpful to me to start to think about like caring for teenagers and and hearing about the details of their interactions with their partners. I remember sitting in my office thinking, I am not in touch with my husband half as much Mm -hmm. as these kids are in touch with their partners. And really um, recognizing the depth and intensity that these relationships can achieve. 
So how do you approach this, Lisa, when you know they're suffering so much? What helps to make teens feel better when they're going through heartbreak? So we can put this into two buckets. One is offering things that will help them feel better. And the other is helping them not do the things that are making them feel worse, (laughs) right? So we can hit it from two sides. So this poor boy is in so much pain, doesn't want to talk at least with his mom who wrote the letter, but she can see he's suffering. I think one thing we should not underestimate is the fact that we can comfort our kids and it doesn't have to involve them talking with us or sharing what's on their minds. So the kinds of things that can give a kid a bump is to be like, you know what? We're getting takeout from your favorite restaurant, right? And you think takeout could help? Something as simple as as doing, going out to a place that they like and bringing it in? Yes. Which I, you're asking the right question. It's like, really? Like this kid's heart is broken and you're offering takeout? Okay. But here's the way to think about it, Rena. For teenagers, everything is more intense. All emotions are more intense. Why is that? Remind us again, psychologically. Oh, it's so interesting, it, right? But maybe we don't understand what's happening in the yeah, brain. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. So the reason for it is that in adolescence, the brain is restructuring and becoming more efficient and more powerful. And it restructures in the order in which it developed, which is from the ancient regions back sort of above the neck to the sophisticated regions, the more modern regions behind the forehead. The ancient regions house our feelings. The sophisticated regions house our perspective maintaining systems. In a teenager, even a 17 year old, but they're starting to gain more frontal lobe activity. Their emotion centers have been fully upgraded, but their perspective maintaining systems have not been fully upgraded. So when they feel a feeling, it comes through full blast Whereas in you and me and all other people over age 25, 26, it's a little bit modulated by experience, perspective, distance, um, a fully formed or fully active frontal lobe. He, this poor boy is feeling the exquisite pain of having been dumped. But interestingly, take out, which again, I mean, not to minimize, but like things like that go f- way further for teens than they do for you and me. Really? Right? Why is that? Why does Do, that? Because the pleasures are greater just ah, as the pains are greater, okay. right? So I'm not saying it's the solution to this boy's right. problem, but I am saying we sometimes as adults blow past comforts that we could offer because they seem so small to us, but they might actually be quite meaningful to the teenager. Mm. I remember in the pandemic, my older daughter was a high school sophomore, and um, you know it was like at one of the like terrible points of like the end, it just you know going on a miserable pandemic, and she was like, "Oh, I hate this." She's like, "I need to go vibe," and she got herself some tea and a candle, Ooh. and she was like, "Yes!" Like it's like blissful, wow. and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" Like I could have all the tea, I could have all the candles. Yes, absolutely <laughs> I would right. Hate this as much as so, I would say number one, try to just comfort this sweet boy, right? Bring him the dog. Make him his favorite foods. Have him come watch a show he loves. Be sweet to him. He doesn't have to talk. If he doesn't want to talk, it may not help him feel better. Like distractions can be really helpful. So I would say do that. See, because I would be the parent doing all the wrong things, like wanting to talk through his feelings, come into the room, and just, you know, sometimes they don't want to really acknowledge you or acknowledge that you are acknowledging the pain. So this is some of those creature comforts. Creature comforts. And I think perspective saying things like, hey, I know this is incredibly painful. I know you will get through this. I know you will look back on this as a hard time that happened. It's not going to feel this way forever. You know, those kinds of simple phrases. If you were a teenager, I mean, Rena, do you remember getting upset as a teenager, right? You're like, this goes down 100 miles, and it goes 100 miles in all directions, and it's forever. And I feel like you feel it for decades to come. There are moments that you just all remember from high school or middle school. Yep. Comes back, yeah. has a lot of intensity. But in those moments, if some nice middle-aged person who you trust is like, listen, you're going to get to the other side of this, that goes far. Mm-hmm. So those are under the category of like things we can do that can help. Mm-hmm. Then there is the category of things that kids sometimes do that are not helping. So one thing is, if this boy is looking at old photos or looking at new photos online of this girl and just like, you know, making that whole thing feel worse, 
a loving adult might say, is this helping you? <laughs> Do you want this helping take you? Okay, a break? but that's actually good because the mom's writing in this letter. I I really think he should cut it off. Like there should be no mm. contact. And I can see why she says that. But what do you think? Like is giving them advice when they are so longing for this person? Like just cut it off, unfollow them. Like does that help? It can, especially if they don't have to see the kid. Right. I mean, not having to confront the person all the time. But this boy is in a situation where he has some options. Like he doesn't have to look at her online photos of her having fun with all these other kids and maybe that other boy or whatever. But, you know, she may sit at his lunch table or be in his math class. I mean, like there's going to be a degree of exposure. The place that is tricky, and I've seen this a lot, Rena, and it's very gendered, but it's a pattern I've really recognized. Especially in these very, very intense love relationships, the pattern I've seen over and over again in heterosexual versions of this is that for the boy, the girl is the person he's ever been the closest with outside of his family. Like, boys as a group are not always great. This is getting better, but not always great at sharing intimacies. But I've seen it happen again and again where it's with his girlfriend that this boy, like, really bears his soul. Then it ends. She may be in pain, but she has 10 girlfriends that she talks like this all the time about, like it talks, you know, intimately with all the time. Whereas the boy can be sort of left on an island because the person he used to talk about, about his deepest feelings is now his ex. And so sometimes what I have seen is that the boy keeps reaching out for support to the ex because she's the one person who's had this kind of intimate support for him. So that is the part, if we're going to like really nestle into the details of this, where I would want adults to be on the lookout. And this, of course, can happen across all genders and any you know configuration. But sometimes when kids have been either dumped or a relationship ends, they'll keep reaching out to their ex for support about it when we want to actually try to reroute those support needs to help them get past the relationship. So maybe to other friends, I mean, maybe to a clinician if needed, but though I would be very cautious because that will make a kid feel like they're broken when they're not, you know, so we want to think that through. But um, watch for kids doing this because it it makes it really hard to move on. So Lisa, go back for a second to that thing that you mentioned about feeling broken. Yeah, thank you. So this is something I'm always really mindful of when recommending psychotherapy for teenagers. And, and it's something I know we've talked about, which is Teenagers can worry that there's something in their words like really wrong with them, you know, like finger quotes really wrong with them, Mm. and especially when they're feeling the height of these kinds of feelings. And I've seen it in my work where sometimes if a person's like, well, you know what you need? You need to talk to a psychologist. They're like, (gasps) my worst reaction realized from teens. Yeah. Something is wrong with me because you're now saying, now I got to go talk to a doctor, right? This Uh. is bad. So if a parent feels that that is warranted, and it may be, then I think the question is, the way to say it is something like, you deserve more support than you have, Mm -hmm. or you deserve somebody who doesn't have any skin in this game for support. But something that couches a clinician as a form of support, not somebody who, you know, you go to because, you know, there's something wrong with you, is the way teenagers say it. That is great, because I think so many parents struggle to get their kids into therapy for this very reason that you mentioned. That is so great to... Remind us yeah. about that, of Just how, how it lands it. for them. Yeah. I like this sort of reconnection because they might not realize it, but do you find talking to them about this, saying exactly what you said, that you know this is sort of the first girl that you've opened your heart to and you might want to feel like you need to go back because you have that security blanket. Does it help as a parent talking to them to make them aware of what they're doing to maybe change their behavior? I think it could. But I think when you put it that way, let's get more specific about how one might say it. Because what you might say is something like, of course you are reaching out to, you know, and then fill in the blank, her, him, whoever you're, you know, we're with, because you were so close. It may give you some relief to be in contact, but I think in the end, it looks like it's making you feel worse, right? Sort of, you know, just share what you're seeing. Who else can support you? Who else can you talk to? So that can be a place that can get maybe some... We're not looking for grand solutions. There are none. Mm -hmm. You know, we're looking for like adjustments that may give kids enough relief that they can kind of keep moving forward and get better. I think the other thing to watch for here 
or to remember here is the value of distraction. That sometimes when kids are upset about something, they do what we call ruminate. Um, and, and when we look at the big, broad data, girls are more likely to do this than boys, um, just by nature of how we've socialized them, but where they just like won't let it go, won't let it go, won't let it go, thinking, 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 and the more they think about it, the worse they feel. It actually makes me think about in this letter where the mom talks about him losing himself in video games. I'm like, you know what? Great. Like, if that's how he can get his mind to take a break from grieving this relationship, like, he deserves that break. Mm. I'm curious, you touched a little bit on gender. Do mm. you find in the research and your experience that do boys and girls process intense heartbreak different? I doubt it feels different to them. What I am confident about, again, in these very, you know, heterosexual contexts, is that what they're allowed to express is very, very different um, in their social communities. Rena, I have this vivid memory of years ago. I um, went and guest taught a developmental psychology class for a friend of mine over at a local university. And um, it was sophomores, college sophomores. And there were these two like really cool guys <laughs> sitting. It was like a lovely small little class sitting in, um, you know, near the front. And they were, um, you could just tell they were sort of big men on campus, mm -hmm. like kind of guys. And they were lovely. They were charming. And we got talking about gendered relationships. And they were very forthcoming. It's a wonderful class and a wonderful college about how guys give each other such a hard time if they express longing, if they express like a, you know, devoted interest to a particular, you know, in this case, girl. Hmm. And what they'll be like, oh, you're whipped, you know, mm. which is the expression they'll use or, oh, you know, like... That the, among guys, there can be this pressure to like, you know, be a player who doesn't have their his heart attached and is just, you know, out having a whole bunch of fun. But Rena, then there was this moment, and this is why I love, I love, I love them so much. I love college kids. I love teenagers. They both had these giant water bottles, right? I think they were also athletes. And the water bottles were on their desks. And they were being very open about like, no, 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 it's not okay. We give we give each other a hard time if there's an expression of longing. But then one guy, I think without even being conscious of it, like wrapped his arm around his water bottle and kind of leaned his head into it and said, but really, we all do kind of want girlfriends, you know, <laughs> and it was so sweet. And I was like, isn't that interesting, yeah. right? Like that yeah. they can voice both sides of it. So my worry for boys and, you know, again, all of this falls apart, all these broad gender generalizations fall apart when you look at any one kid, is that they have all the same deep, powerful mm. longings and feelings, but they're not in um, necessarily in social environments that allow those, support those, are gentle about those. And that's often why I feel like I've seen guys going back to their ex-girlfriend to try to get the support they need, which just only entrenches mm -hmm. their pain mm. in some terrible ways. Yeah. Is it possible for heartbreak to be prevented? Nope. <laughs> There's no way around it. You just it's part of adolescence. No. It's part of life. You've got to just it's, go through it. It's part of life. But I, you're asking a question. I think any parent in these shoes would have, yeah. which is like, how could we have gotten right away around this? Like, how could this not have happened? And you can even picture parents, and I've seen parents who, like, when they see their kid getting deep into stuff, are like, "Don't go there. Don't go there. Mm -hmm. Like, this mm -hmm. is your time to be light and easy, right? You're yeah. really into this. Like, this, you know, depth and intensity. You don't need right now." You know what, Rena? This is life. This is the pain that comes with life. And yeah. the only thing I think we can offer by way of comfort to ourselves and to our kids, and again, this is something I've just learned by doing and watching, we can only feel as good as we can feel bad. Our emotions, like the intensity that we feel, to have real joys and delights and pleasures, you also have to be available to having real pains. And, and real real heartbreak. And we can't put like a damper over the negative emotions only. Like if you put a damper over emotions, it goes over everything. So this, you know, this is just part of life. But it takes us back to the thing that matters the most, which is not the presence or absence of pain, but how it gets handled, right? So if this boy is weeping, if this boy is hanging out with the dog, if this boy is watching old TV shows, if he's maybe talking to some friends, maybe can let his parents offer some comfort, this is as good as it gets. If he's trashing his ex online, if he's smoking tons of weed, if he's being a total bear to live with, 
then we worry. That is great. Just just knowing that sometimes this is as good as it can get in this moment and it's not a perfect situation. And also that you can't shield them. We do so much of protecting our kids, safety, video games, social media, everything that I am like, I'm just exhausted of all the things I have to think of as a parent to like shield my kid. And then you feel love so intensely. We all understand what that feels like to be rejected, right? Yeah. So you want to think of something. Oh, geez, if I had just done that, they would have handled right. this relationship a little bit better. Because we hate to see our kids in pain. It's true. Full stop. True. It's the worst thing as a parent. And so, of course, our minds go there. Mm. Oh, well, you know, I just feel it. I think these are emotions that you say happen in your teen years that are just amplified. And I feel like even at 45, I <laughs> still remember and, and feel those emotions decades later. Yep. They leave a mark. They do leave a mark. <laughs> they leave a mark. I really do. So what do you have for us, Lisa, for parenting to go? One thing that I have found to be really, really valuable about teenagers having intense relationships while they are still home with us is that they learn a lot and we learn a lot about the kinds of relationships they're having. And so let's assume this has been actually up till this very painful point, a really good, healthy relationship between this boy and this girl. One thing that a parent could do in this moment is to say, look, I know this did not end the way you wanted it to end, and maybe you didn't want it to end, but here's what I can say. You now know what it feels like to have somebody who is trustworthy and close and how good that feels, and you know what it feels like to be treated well and to treat someone well. This one didn't last, but it has given you a blueprint for the kind of relationships you're going to be looking for going forward. Mm. You can also say the opposite right? Sometimes kids find themselves in relationships that hopefully end because they're not healthy relationships. And again, with some time and some distance, it can be a really good basis of conversation about like, okay, what did you learn in this relationship? What are you going to be watching out for going forward? These early relationships give us information about what works and what doesn't. And I think sometimes having a loving adult talk with kids about what they learned, good or bad, can help them make really, really smart choices going forward. The conversations really matter. And you've yep. always said to us, it really makes a difference in the life of teens. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Lisa. I, I just don't know why, but romance and sex as a parent talking to my child makes me very squeamish. So I'm glad to have some <laughs> fortification and Lisa language to work in there from you. <laughs> I'm glad to offer it. And um, next week, Lisa, we're going to actually talk about a topic that a lot of kids also deal with is bullying. What should you do if you know your child is being bullied? Um, and it might not necessarily be on school grounds. We'll have that next week. I'll see you next week. I'll see you next week. <laughs>